So I believe everybody here works as mediators um, as part of the mandatory mediation program that was established in the um, Oregon Landlord Tenant Act. Um, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about the law that applies to the tenancies um, for, you know, for those tenants and landlords that you guys may be seeing um, in your mediations. Uh, my name is Samantha Sheehan. I am an attorney with the Oregon Law Center. Um, there we go. <laughs> and we're gonna go over a few different things today. Um, so I'll give you a brief introduction for myself and my uh, position and kind of what I do. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the scope and application of this law, which is going to be important for all of you, um, because you know if if the if the tenant in question or the landlord in, in question doesn't fall under this section of the law, then they really don't qualify for this mandatory mediation program. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We like to call that a threshold question in legalese, um, but we, we can talk about it as scope and application of that law. We're gonna talk a little bit about mandatory mediation versus voluntary dispute resolution. Both of these are set forth in the Landlord-Tenant Act. Um, I think that most of you are probably more familiar with mandatory mediation. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that really means um, and when that applies um, and what kinds of, what kinds of disputes um, are subject to that mandatory mediation provision. Then we're going to do just a brief legal overview um, for some of the, you know, highlight some of the, the main differences in this kind of, in this area of the law, right? So we're talking about facility tenancies, meaning, you know, a manufactured home park or a floating home marina where the tenants own their home and rent the space um, that their home is sited on. So, so we'll talk a little bit about that law, some of the main differences and similarities with the regular apartment tenancies, um, you know, some some important things for you guys to keep um, keep in mind as you're doing this important work. And then we will have some time for a Q and A. So, <clears throat> oh my gosh, why is it going back? There we go. <laughs> All right, so um, like I said, I'm an attorney for manufactured home parks and floating home marinas, and I am based at the Oregon Law Center. For those of you that don't know, Oregon Law Center is one of Oregon's legal aid organizations. There are two legal aid organizations in Oregon. Um, it's the Legal Aid Services of Oregon, known as LASSO, and Oregon Law Center, known as OLC. Between our two organizations, we cover the entire state of Oregon. So low income tenants in every county in Oregon do have a local legal aid office that they can apply for services through. Um, I think it's important to note as well that um, LASSO and OLC have a joint program called the Eviction Defense Project. Um, and that serves the entire state of Oregon. Um, and they provide um, exactly what it sounds like. They provide eviction defense. So if a tenant has had a an eviction already filed against them. So that means that they're in court, they have a court date and a summons from the court. They can call the Eviction Defense Project hotline. Uh, an intake worker will either answer their call or call them back. Um, and there's a pretty quick turnaround in terms of getting tenants advice or representation so long as they qualify financially for our services and there's no conflict, conflict there. Um, so there are lots of services for low-income tenants around the state of Oregon. Um, if you are ever looking for some or have questions about it, the website OregonLawHelp.org is really helpful. Um, there is an interactive map there that can help you find the right the right uh, office for for a tenant, depending on their county. My position's a little bit different than just regular legal aid. Um, I have a my position is funded through a special assessment that is put on each manufactured home owner, um, they pay $10 a year as a special assessment that goes to the MMCRC. It helps fund um, both you know, the program and those who work there and the services that is provided, as well as me um, and the services that I provide to both tenants um, and doing outreach and training like today's session. <clears throat> 
Uh, my position is currently funded through January 1st of 2027, and I plan to stay in it until then. Um, so hopefully I you'll be seeing more of me in the next coming years as well. Um, again, this presentation applies only to facility tenancies. So we're talking about in, uh, in the law, lawyers, we like to call it the back end of the Landlord Tenant Act. Um, but essentially we're dealing with here 90.505 to 90.875. Um, <clears throat> what is nice and confusing about this area of law is that while the back end, that, that section 505 through 875 applies only to facility tenancies, the front half of 90, so 9100 through 90.500, right, that also applies to facility tenancies if it's not in conflict, right? So so it, the law that applies is a little bit confusing because you do have to, you know, first take a look at the back end, then take a look at the front end statute that would relate as well and make sure that the front end doesn't also apply, right? So, so the law is a little bit complicated. And I think that's sometimes why we see landlords getting things wrong um, and sometimes why some of these conflicts arise that end up in your all's hands. Um, and an important caveat, this is not legal advice. Um, it's just an overview of the law. I am not allowed to give out legal advice um, unless someone is my client. That's just an ethical duty for lawyers. Um, so when we get to the Q&A section, if you all can keep your questions either um, you know, to the law and trying to understand you know, what the law allows and what it doesn't allow um, rather than a specific case, um, or, you know, if you can't figure out how to kind of put it in that legal sense, you can ask a hypothetical question. So you can say, say tenant A did this and landlord B did this, what would be the result, right? So I can ask, I can answer hypothetical questions so long as they're not about real cases and we're not talking about people here. So the legal application, this is kind of what we were speaking about before when we're talking about who does the law apply to, right? So this applies only to facility tenants. Facility tenants are people who are tenants who own their manufactured home or their floating home, and they rent a space um, where that home is sited within a park or a marina. Um, a manufactured, what is a facility? So a facility is either a manufactured uh, dwelling park, so manufactured home park, right, um, or a marina. And basically what a park or marina are is when you have four or more spaces that are available for rent and they're in um, a relatively close area of one another. I believe that the law says something about, let's say like 400 feet, but that's really not important. Um, you know, if you've got four or more of those homes situated closely together, you're going to be dealing with a park. Um, marinas are similar, but you're looking at slips, not spaces, right? So, um, you know, there's going to have to be some kind of dock, some kind of separators between the spaces. Um, but again, you know, you're looking at four or more spaces in, in either one of these to be, be a facility. Um, a manufactured dwelling is either a residential trailer, a mobile home, a manufactured home, um, or a prefabricated structure. And it, this includes any like accessory buildings or structures. Um, it does not include RVs, travel trailers, or tiny homes. So when you're thinking about a free prefabricated structure and a tiny home, often those can get conflated. Basically what you're thinking about when we're talking about a manufactured dwelling is a home that was created in a factory, built in a factory that is can be moved on the highways, right? And then once it's moved, and, and that means like pulled by a large truck on a truck bed, right? And it can't drive itself. Um, so, that, so that's kind of one of the main clues here. If someone has an RV or a travel trailer, something that they could either drive on its own, right? Even if the the driving mechanisms no longer work, even if there is no longer an engine in the RV, right? That is not a manufactured home. That's still an RV and that does not count as a manufactured dwelling. That means that that person is not a facility tenant. That person is not 
um, that person does not have the right to mandatory mediation, right? So this applies only to those homes that are manufactured dwellings, um, not the RVs, not the travel trailers, um, even though sometimes those are located within a qualifying park, right? So you might have neighbors, someone who lives in a qualified manufactured dwelling living right next to someone who lives in an RV, meaning here, this tenant is a facility tenant, this tenant is not. So you can have a mix of different types of tenants inside of your park. Um, in order for this law to apply, all of these things have to check off, right? So they have to own the home, it has to be a qualifying home, and it has to be in a facility, right? Um, floating homes, so floating homes essentially are just moored structures. Um, you know, some attorneys think that there's a stricter definition of what floating homes are, but there is a case on point that basically says um, that that really expands that definition and essentially just says that as long as it's um, in a facility in so in in a marina and is being used primarily as um, you know for occupancy, so primarily as that person's primary residence, um, that then that would count as a floating home. So um, you know some people, some especially landlord attorneys are going to be operating more under that stricter definition that really you're thinking about again that motorized function is this something that can drive itself right can you move it out of the of the marina or not um but now uh, under this case you know we're expanding that definition and it basically even if it has a motor even if it can move on its own so long as it is on piles and or it, so long as it's moored in that um in that marina and is used primarily for occupancy then it will count as a floating home for this all right <clears throat> so let's chat a little bit about the differences between mandatory mediation and voluntary dispute resolution so now that we know you know who would be qualified to uh, avail themselves of mandatory mediation um, let's talk a little bit about what that means. So landlords are required to, oh no, sorry about that. So landlords are required to establish a policy um, about mandatory mediation, and that needs to be in the rental agreement. Um, now, often rental agreements have been entered into a long time ago. People have lived in these parks for 20 years sometimes, right? And so um so the law does allow landlords to make unilateral changes to the rental agreement, meaning that the landlord can by themselves without the consent of the tenant, add a mandatory mediation policy to the rental agreement. Um, basically what that policy has to state is, you know, where they can get resources for mandatory mediation, how to request mandatory mediation, um, it has to give uh, information about OHCS and MMCRC so that tenants understand that they can request, uh, that they can go through them to request that mediation. Um, primarily, the, so the statute lays out, it, it, basically, it believe the legislature made the statute for the purpose of allowing landlords and tenants to negotiate um, and mediate their disputes related to either compliance with the rental agreement or the law, right? So chapter 90, um, your conduct within the facility, and this goes for both landlord and tenant compliance, right? So a tenant can request it, a landlord can request it. So, a, you know, um, or a modification of a rule or regulation. Um, so, so generally speaking, right, landlords can't just willy-nilly change the rental agreement or change the rules and regulations. Um, it's a contract. Contracts require assent, right? They require both parties to agree to it, um, to know what's in it. And so landlords can't just change that. That's a, you know, a change in the bargain, right? So um, that would require them to offer something new to the tenant so that the tenant could, you know, would want to agree to it, right? Um, <clears throat> But the law does allow landlords to change rules or regulations um, if they follow a certain process. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a later slide. But generally speaking, you know, landlords can't just change that, that rental agreement on their own. Um, 
Um, so, so that's really what this mandatory mediation is supposed to be in regards to. So we're really talking about, you know, disputes over the rental agreement and whether someone's complying with it, disputes over the law and whether someone's complying, um, their conduct within the facility. So like menacing or harassing or, um, you know, that kind of behavior, right? Um, and then, like I said, the modifications of rules or regulations. So all that mandatory mediation means is that if that mediation is requested, then the parties must participate in the process. It doesn't require that the parties resolve any or all of the issues through mediation. It doesn't even really require that they say or do much at the mediation, right? It requires that they show up and, um, and you know, and that they respond to the notices and that they, you know, follow the, the timeline um, and, and, you know, and don't miss those deadlines, right? But it doesn't require that that the dispute actually be resolved. And so I think that that's a, a common misunderstanding because the term mandatory mediation certainly sounds like it's mandatory to mediate, um, but really what that means is it's mandatory to go through the steps, to walk through the process, right? It's really, it isn't mandatory that you truly resolve or, or, or even really, you know, in good faith, try to resolve those agreements. That That's pretty hard to do. Um, it's also important to note that mediation is um, considered a settlement discussion and settlement discussions are barred from, from future hearings, right? So generally speaking, what goes on in a mediation cannot later be brought up in court as proof against one or the other party. So settlement, uh, so these medi mediations are, um, are confidential and, you know, need to stay that way. Um, so in terms of requesting that mediation, the landlord, uh, a tenant or more than one tenant, or OHCS through the MMCRC may request the mediation and initiate the process. Once one of these parties has requested and initiated the process, that is what triggers that mandatory requirement that the parties start engaging in the process, right? Um, and there is a timeline here. If you take a look at 90.767, it goes into that timeline in more detail. Um, but generally we're looking at about 30 days to respond um, to requests to mediate. Any dispute resolved through mediation can be done only through the express consent and agreement of the parties. Again, this is just so important. Mediation is not, it's not arbitration, right? The mediators are not there to, um, to, to decide what, what the right outcome is to, uh, you know, force parties to agree to something. Mediators are really there to help facilitate the conversations. Um, I think that a valuable asset for mediators as well is if you, you know, have a brief under, uh, you know, a brief understanding of the law that, you know, when unreasonable offers or counter offers are made, that you have that, that knowledge to then say, okay, you know, that's a great offer. This is kind of what the law says, right? Like you're, you're there to help mediate the discussion and help the discussion go well, but you are also there to add value to that discussion, right? Um, add somewhat of an expertise, right? You don't want to just be there to facilitate an agreement between landlord and tenant that could result in, you know, when one party has a much higher understanding of the law over the other, which is often the case when we're dealing with seniors and uh, corporate landlords, right? That um, I think it is important that that you guys have a general understanding of what the law requires of landlords. And so um, tenants are not agreeing to things in mediation, thinking that they're, you know, it, it's a good deal when really they're agreeing to something that um, under the law, they would never have to agree to, right? So I think it is a, a good thing for you guys to have a baseline understanding of you know what the law requires, what some of the landlord obligations are, what some of the tenant obligations are, um, and that way you can kind of you know you can push these mediations towards more equitable resolutions and resolutions that are more um, more in alignment with you know, with the law, right? And what the legislature has legislature has kind of set forth as as you know our goals and our policy intent for for these types of 
tendencies. Um, <clears throat> so mandatory mediation does not apply to the following things. Now, if the rental agreement specifically says that these things can or are subject to mandatory mediation, or before the mandatory mediation is initiated, all of the parties that are subject to that mediation agree that they want to go to mediation over this issue, then they can go to mediation for these things. But, um, but like we spoke about above, where either the landlord, a tenant, or more than one tenant, or OHCS can on their own initiate that mandatory mediation process, and then that, you know, triggers the requirements for the landlord and the tenant to actually engage in the process, right? Um, they can't do that for these topics. These topics have to, the mediation can be initiated, but it has to be initiated by the agreement of all of the parties together, right? Not just one party. Um, and so those topics are facility closures, facility sales, rent increases, rent payments um, or amount owed. So, you know, past due utility bills, things like that. Um, tenant violations that are alleged in a valid termination notice. So if a tenant has already received a termination notice, they cannot then initiate the mandatory mediation process over that termination notice, right? Um, now they could do that if they received a violation notice, but a termination notice, which is the basis for an eviction, right? Once that notice has gone out, that the tenant can no longer on their own request mandatory mediation for that dispute. Um, unauthorized occupants under 90.403. So this is a different type of unauthorized occupant this doesn't mean that you have someone living at your, like they, so say I'm the, I'm the owner and I have the rental agreement with the park and I have my cousin, um, you know, from New York come live with me because she lost her job and she moved home and now she's going to come live with me, but I didn't have her apply with the park. She doesn't have a rental agreement with the park. She's what we would call an unauthorized occupant, right? Um, but not this type. So this type of unauthorized occupant means that I had my cousin move in, she's not a, a tenant, and then I move out. So now I'm gone, I got a new job, and I moved to Utah, right? So now the only person living in the home is someone who is not a tenant, who doesn't have a rental agreement with the park. Under that circumstance, um, you know, that person who's not a tenant, they could not engage in mandatory mediation, right? So um, 90.403 gives a landlord a way to evict that person under a 24 hour notice um, for because they're not a tenant. Right? So um, and then any dispute arising after the termination of the tenancy is also not subject to mandatory mediation. So, you know, say somebody is evicted for non-payment of rent, um, and they move out, they enter into, say, a storage agreement with their landlord, um, and now there is a dispute about whether they're allowed to come onto the property every day to conduct repairs as they get ready to sell, sell the home under that storage agreement, right? In that circumstance, the tenancy has already been terminated. Only what exists now is a storage agreement. That is a non-residential tenancy, right? That's there's no right to possession. There's no right for that tenant to to live there. They don't have the rights as a tenant. They don't have their rental agreement. They are under a storage agreement. So, um, so you know, once that tenancy is terminated, whether the the tenant you know gave their own thirty day notice and moved out voluntarily, whether they moved out before a court eviction and a judgment, right? As long as that tenancy is terminated and that person no longer lives in the park, or you know maybe they they still live in the park, but they've got a judgment against them for an eviction, and the sheriffs are going to come any day to remove them, right? Again, that's not something where mandatory mediation would apply. And so, what the difference is for voluntary dispute resolution is that 
landlords can put into their um, into their agreements other ways to other types of dispute resolution policies and practices. Um, these dispute resolution practices can apply to, um, you know, they can write them for groups. So, so say for a tenant association, they can write them for, um, you know, the specific specific topics that are not subject to mandatory mediation. Um, and they can also set a voluntary dispute resolution policy um, that is an alternative or a second option um, after mandatory mediation, right? So the voluntary dispute resolution, that's just something that landlords can do if they want. They can put something in their rental agreement that you know allows for, for uh, more, more or different dispute resolution um, practices, right? So, you know, something that we've seen more and more is our arbitration clauses. Um, it's unclear whether or not those would be enforceable because there's a federal law on point that pretty much says like, we love arbitration clauses, go arbitration clauses. Um, and so generally that federal law would prevail over our state law, which says, you don't use arbitration, you use the state courts and here's the state law, right? So it's it's unclear whether that would stand or not, but that is an example of a voluntary dispute resolution um, that could be added into an agreement. Now, of course, a tenant would have to agree to that um, because arbitration is binding and someone else does make that decision once you go to those arbitrators, right? So the you know it has to be in the rental written rental agreement at the time that the tenancy commences for something like that to be enforceable but the big difference here between what we're between voluntary dispute resolution and mandatory mediation is that under a voluntary dispute resolution um policy one could try to initiate that that process but there's not a requirement on the other side that they actually engage in that process, right? So it maybe is a requirement in the rental agreement, but it is not a requirement under the law, right? And so, um, you know, there's not specific damages for failing to comply. Um, there is not a specific suit or claim that you may have for failing to comply with voluntary dispute resolution. Whereas under the mandatory mediation statute, there are, right? So, so it, it, it does require that all landlords have this policy in place, and it does require that all landlords and tenants participate in the process once that process has been initiated. That is all that's mandatory about this kind of mediation, right? It's that there must be a policy, it must be in the agreement, and parties must participate once it's requested. Um, that's all that's mandatory. All right, and let's talk a little bit about the differences in the law um, from the front end, just regular apartment tenancies to um, what we're talking about, these park tenancies. So something that's important to note, um, and I think this is really important when you're dealing with any sort of negotiation or mediation, in court for landlord tenant law, there's what we call fee shifting. That means that if this dispute ends up in the circuit court and you know a judge is deciding the dispute, whoever wins that case can make the loser pay their fees. And that includes court costs, filing fees, um, attorney's fees, right? And that can get really expensive, particularly um, if a landlord is using one of you know the the really experienced seasoned landlord attorneys that are out there, um, they're going to be expensive, right? Particularly ones out in that Portland area, you know, you're probably looking at three hundred plus an hour, right? And so, um, so that can be really expensive for a tenant, and it can also be really expensive for a landlord. And often, just bringing up the fact that fee shifting exists can push parties to, um, you know, have a little bit more perspective when they're thinking about their position, right? Because while they may think, you know, yeah, I'm right, or, um, you know, maybe the law isn't clear on this, but I feel like morally I'm in the right, 
once you take into consideration that this dispute could very well end up in court and that, you know, resting solely on that moral position might not be as attractive once you realize that you may end up with a couple thousand dollar bill to pay for the other side, right? So I think, um, so it is important that that parties understand that that is a consequence of going to court. Um, and it definitely is, is something that often helps resolve issues. Um, it can be something that even, you know, can get money for some side, can be a point of, you know, settlement of waiving rent, um, you know, in order to, to not bring a claim, right? There's all sorts of things, um, but, but that you can do with the fee shifting um, and, you know, kind of using that as leverage for either side. Um, but I do think it's important that that's something that's talked about, something that all the parties know, um, because it, it does change, you know, someone's risk assessment when they're thinking about the benefits of, of mediating and finding a solution through mediation and the benefits of going to court and finding a solution that way. Um, you know, the risks are just much higher once you get into court. Um, so tenant committees. Uh, I'm sure that you guys have come across tenant committees um, in your work. There are, the law recognizes what's called a tenant committee of seven. Um, a tenant committee of seven is elected by the whole park. Um, and they have the right to engage in discussions with the landlord about issues that are going on in the park. Um, and the landlord is required to meet with them at least once a year once they've held that election. Now, the mandatory mediation statute doesn't mention tenant committees um, or a committee of seven initiating that mediation. Um, however, it does say that mediation may be initiated by one or more tenants. So I think theoretically, a tenant committee could um, could request mediation. Now we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, but because mediation is completely voluntary in terms of um, you know, assenting to an agreement, unless that committee has the express permission and agency to, to agree to something on others' behalf, um, it's very possible that a tenant committee mediated, mediated agreement would not bind everyone, every tenant in the park, um, but only bind those who signed the agreement. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's super clear, but I think the, in the law, I don't think it's super clear, but I do think that the, the policy rationale behind mediation to me does indicate that you would need each tenant to assent to that mediated agreement um, and that it would not be able to, the, a tenant committee would not be able to use their legal agency to agree to a mediated agreement on behalf of other tenants in the park. Um, and again, I believe that because of, of the policy rationales behind what mediation is and why we have mediation. Um, and I just don't think that someone who is you know, not privy to the language of the agreement, not privy to the discussions and mediation, um, and, and has not signed the agreement, I just don't believe that we can, they can actually be bound. So while, while a tenant committee may be able to initiate um, mediation by that clause of one or more tenants, I don't think that it's the most effective way to negotiate um, these kind of park-wide issues, unless, you know, you do have that park-wide assent. And it does look like I've got a question there from Andrea. Yeah, thanks. I was wondering if you could repeat that just with like an example, because I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, for sure. So, so let's say um, we'll just call it Sam Park. So tenants at Sam Park um, have decided to form a committee of seven. Um, a committee of seven, again, that's a legal, legally recognized tenant committee that um, the landlord is required to meet with at least once a year once they've held a park-wide election and you know been elected by the other tenants in the park. So let's just say we did that at Sam Park. We've estab established the Sam Park Committee of Seven um, and we're having utility billing issues in the park, right? Um, we think we're being over overbilled or something. And we have decided to request mandatory mediation 
on behalf of the entire park because you know we feel like the entire park right the the issue is occurring for the entire park the the issue is the same for everyone they're they're billing everyone an additional ten dollars a month that they shouldn't be billing them right so we're we're requesting mediation to discuss this issue to get their get their records if we go to mediation and we resolve the issue with the landlord that say, okay, well, this has been happening for six months. Landlord for six months is going to pay every tenant $10 or credit every tenant $10 on their utility bill, right? So you'll see minus 10 every single time on your utility bill. And that's what we agreed to in mediation. I don't, if the landlord then, and so just the committee of seven signs, so you have seven signatures on there, right? I don't think that one of the other tenants, so tenant C, right, who's not on the SAM committee of seven, I don't think that that tenant could go to court to enforce the mediated agreement to require the landlord to pay them that $10 a month because that person did not sign the agreement, right? Or say, you know, on the flip side, maybe the tenant committee agrees with the landlord that no one will, um, that, you know, we're no longer going to use the, the rec hall after 10 p.m., that it's just too loud. We used to use it till 11. Now we're agreeing we're only going to use it until 10. The, the tenant committee signs off of it. The seven people sign off on it, right? And then, you know, people that aren't in that seven, they, they all go to the rec center at 1030, right? Can the landlord enforce that mediated agreement against those people who didn't sign? I don't think so, because they were not privy to the to the negotiations, the mediation, and they didn't, or you know, maybe they didn't even read the the mediated agreement. We have no idea of knowing whether they had or not, and they didn't sign it. So, you know, while I think the law is broad enough that it would allow a tenant committee to initiate the mediation process, I really don't think that anyone is bound by a mediated agreement unless they've signed that agreement, right? Okay, yeah, that's really helpful. I thought that's what you meant, but I just needed to hear it for sure in an example, so thanks. Of course, yeah, no, this, I'm happy to answer any questions, give examples. I know that I literally stare at this law all day long, every single day, and it still is confusing to me, so uh, please, <laughs> questions are totally, totally fine, I, I understand. And um, I see Lisa has got a question. Yeah, so I just want to be clear. So if you had said that if this uh, committee of seven does have um, like the proxies, okay, for those. So let's say it's kind of like what I think about an HOA, right? If, if people, if everyone that's within that park that's being represented by that committee of seven, is um, aware of the mediation and they sign, let's say, a, a proxy that says, yes, this person is representing and I will abide by whatever it is, then that that would still count. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So, you know, there is something in the law that allows um, tenants and landlords to have a non-attorney agent represent them in these types of, uh, in, in mediations, right? And so I think as long as you have that agency paperwork, that proxy paperwork, like you said, like that, that there really is a right that that tenant has assented to this other person engaging in negotiation on their behalf, um, then I think that, you know, that's, that probably is fine. Um, you know, again, I think that that person would have to read the agreement and possibly sign it as well, right? So, you know. But that could happen, okay. are you saying that would happen after the fact? I I think so. So, you know, generally hmm. speaking, if, if you have an attorney or an agent representing you, you've given them, you know, boundaries, right? So you're saying, I will agree to, a through B, but or A through C, but anything after that, I'm not going to agree to. If it's D, 
call me and we can talk about it. Right. Right. So like they have these parameters when they go in and they know what they can agree to and what they can't agree to. And then where that line is that they need to call and get that permission again. I think it has to be that specific. Right. So if that person, if the person being represented isn't there, I think they either have to assent to and agree to parameters for the agency. Right. And that should probably be done in writing that's signed before, be, you know, prior to the mediation. And then, you know, should the mediation go a certain way where you're not in that, in that parameter where that person has already assented to agree to that, then I think it does require like a pause in the mediation and a discussion between that agent and the tenant. Um, because, because again, like it, mediation really requires the, that, acceptance, the agreement of both parties. And so if, if there is a party that's affected, that's not present, I think it has to be very, very, you know, the, you know, going into the agreement, the fact that those are going into the mediation, the fact that, uh, that other tenants are being represented needs to be very clear to everyone. And I think done in writing also needs to be very clear to the landlord. Um, and, you know, probably the landlord even needs to see some sort of a proof that they have that <clears throat> that agency to negotiate on behalf of the park, right? So, you know, I, I'm not sure that mediating with tenant committees is really the best option. Um, unfortunately, because it, it really is a great way for tenants to, you know, empower themselves, to build community, to disseminate information, all sorts of, it's, it's really great tool. Um, but in terms of really resolving these types of conflicts on behalf of everyone in the park, it it becomes more tricky, I think, because I, you can imagine a situation where, you know, some of these parks are big, you've got kind of clicks in the park, right, that, you know, your tenant committee is, you know, this group of people that maybe gets along with 80% of the group or 80% of the park, but that there's 20% of the park that they really don't get along with. And you can imagine a situation where, that tenant committee goes in, negotiates or mediates a settlement with landlord, and then that 20% of the park <clears throat> objects to the settlement, right, or objects to that mediated agreement um, for whatever reason, right, like whether it's a valid reason or not. But you can imagine like how there could be conflict between even though the tenant committee was elected and is there to represent the interest of the whole park, um, that you can, you know, it's pretty easy to imagine these types of disputes coming up and and people being like, well, I didn't agree to that. And generally speaking, you know, you can't be bound to something that you haven't agreed to, particularly when we're talking about mediation that is supposed to be based on that voluntary, um, you know, voluntary assent. So, so I think it's possible. I don't think it's the best practice if you get a if you get a tenant committee coming into mediation wanting to mediate a park wide issue. I do think it would be worth you know, having a conversation with both the landlord and the tenant committee at the beginning of that mediation to ensure that, you know, the, that agency exists, um, that, you know, there's a discussion about who would be bound by the agreement, who could enforce the agreement, that kind of a thing. So um, I, I do think that that's really important at the beginning of any sort of mediation with a group of tenants that, that it's really clear about, you know, who does this apply to? what what parameter you know they don't obviously you wouldn't have to tell the landlord what parameters your tenant set because that's like the whole it's like giving away the whole the whole thing right but but I do think that having you know having that discussion and making sure that that agency exists and um before you know starting that mediation is important um if you know I could imagine that mediation goes on for a bit and then it comes out that maybe there you know that the tenant committee is trying to negotiate for everybody and that's not what the landlord was thinking. Um, and then, you know, if that ends up wasting time and you have to pull the mediation, usually what that does is sour the landlord to the tenant committee because they're like, well, what the heck you wasted my time. So, so I do think that, that that's a nice threshold question to do. Um, rent increases again. Um, so rent increases are not subject to mandatory mediation. Um, rent increases are required to, um, you have to, landlords have to provide a 90 day notice, written notice to tenants. Um, and that notice has to conform to the requirements um, in 90.600. Um, basically, you know, it has to state the old rent amount, the, the rent increase amount, the new, new rent amount, um, 
you know, things like that. And that, that statute is very clear. So if you, if you're ever wondering what needs to be in that notice, just take a look at that statute. It's short and sweet. Um, this year, the legislature changed that law again to actually create a maximum cap on that rent increase amount. And so prior it was 7% plus the, um, CPI for the year, which is released in September of the prior year. Um, and so that, that number is based on inflation. And so you would add that number with the 7% and that would give you the maximum amount that you could increase someone's rent in any 12 month period. Um, so now the law has changed that you can only increase um, someone's rent once a year. So you can't, you know, if the maximum amount was is 10%, you couldn't do 5% in April, 5% in in November, right? You, you only once a year now. Um, and and regardless of what CPI is, and that's still the equation, 7% plus CPI, um, but regardless of what that CPI is, um, the maximum it can ever be is 10%. So um, so you still do your equation, but if you're over 10 after you've done the equation, then you stop at 10, 10 is your max. Um, again, so legal rent increases are not subject to mandatory mediation. If people are attempting to mediate um, over a rent increase that they think was improperly noticed or given too soon or something like that, um, they could do that, right? Because what is excluded from mandatory mediation regarding rent increases are rent increases that were issued pursuant to 90.600. And if they didn't get that notice right, then it was not issued pursuant to that statute. There are damages for increasing someone's rent either above the amount or basically just increasing someone's rent um, that's not in alignment with 90.600. Um, and that's three months rent penalty for the tenant. So um, generally that attaches when the tenant when, so, you know, if you get your notice in October and it takes place January 1st, the damages wouldn't um, attach. We call them until January 1st when that new rent amount would be due and only if that notice was wrong. So if the notice is wrong, that is something they could bring to mandatory mediation. Um, I don't, that would not be my preference for people to go to mandatory mediation over um, a rent increase because the law is really clear about what is required in that notice. If the notice is wrong or the amount is wrong, um, you know, that's either, that it's a pretty quick fix, right? Like if you catch it before it comes into effect, a letter to the landlord saying, hey, you didn't follow the law, fix it. They will, they'll just reissue a new notice and fix it generally speaking. Um, or, you know, if it's been past that date, then tenants are entitled to damages um, and, generally they're not going to get those kinds of damages in a mandatory mediation. Um, so, so rent increase is not the best venue for mandatory mediation, um, but can get there if the notice is incorrect. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about rights and obligations. Um, so, you know, there are habitability requirements in parks. Of course, these are significantly less than in apartments because the tenant owns the home, right? So the home itself is the tenant's responsibility. Um, it's the, the rented space, the common areas, the connections to the home, uh, for utility connections to the home, those kinds of things and, and trees are, are the landlord's responsibility in terms of when we're talking about whether or not something is habitable. Landlords are required to provide a 24 hour notice to enter whenever they want to come onto the tenant space for any purpose other than reading a sub meter, which they're allowed to come on once a month to read a sub meter without notice. Um, that notice is, is the notice required is actual notice. So it doesn't have to be a written notice. Um, it can be a text message, a phone call, a conversation. Um, but the landlord does have to actually notify the tenant that they are going to be there uh, entering the space and the reason for the entry um, 24 hours prior. Um, so there are tenant obligations regarding the rented space. So, you know, in an effort to give tenants a little bit more autonomy in these types of situations, considering they do own their own home, um, 
the old coalition of landlords and tenants together um, kind of carved out the rented space as the tenant's responsibility. So, um, you know, if there are pipes under the home or above the home, right? Anything that happens after the connection provided by the landlord, anything that's after that on the rented space is the tenant's responsibility. Um, so, you know, leaks in that area, tenant's responsibility. Um, if, you know, a clog, tenant's responsibility, right? Even, even if we're talking about pipes that are underneath the home, as long as it is you know, past the connection where the, that, that landlord has to provide the connection to the rented space. And then once it's past that, it's the tenant's responsibility. Um, the one caveat here is that, um, you know, if a tenant moves in and there is landscaping already on the space, so like lots of, say, trees in particular, um, and those trees have not been taken well care of, um, and roots have gotten into the pipes underneath the rented space, um, that is often a landlord responsibility because the hazard trees, trees are the landlord's responsibility. And so failing to uh, maintain those trees that, and then having that cause damage, um, that is something that, that, um, that the landlord would have to be responsible for. <clears throat> um, and then there are, we spoke about this a little bit briefly, but there are some, there are ways that a landlord can uh, modify the rental agreement and the rules and regulations after that rental agreement has already been entered into. And so we'll talk a little bit about how a landlord can do that and for what reasons a landlord can do that. Um, we see a lot of issues with the changing of rules and regulations, at least I do. I'm not sure um, if you guys have seen that in your practice much. Um, but but often, you know, there's a process that the landlord has to follow. And so often there's a dispute over whether or not that process was followed. Um, and then, you know, there's also a dispute over whether or not um, that rule would be allowed, right? So whether or not that's a rule that the landlord can actually change anyways. Um, so that's probably something that you guys will see or have seen in your practice as well. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit at the end about evictions, um, the different types of evictions, um, and that court process as well. Now, because, because once a, a termination notice has been issued, that's no longer subject to mandatory mediation. This may not be something that you guys are seeing or dealing with very often, but I do think that it's important to understand the process, understand you know, why someone can be evicted and when they can be evicted. Um, because again, you know, if we're talking about if someone's in mandatory mediation over a rental agreement dispute, that rental agreement dispute or a violation of that rental agreement, that can be a basis for a termination notice, right? So even if there is no termination notice at this time and the parties are in mandatory mediation to, to, to try and resolve that violation, if mandatory if mediation fails and they don't resolve that issue, then the landlord does reserve the right to then issue an eviction notice, a termination notice for that conduct, right? So if it's not resolved in mediation, tenant can get a termination notice for the conduct or the violation. And so understanding, you know, the length of the eviction process, you know, kind of what happens, basic costs, those kinds of things can be really useful to, you know, just even preface, you know, starting off a, a mediation where, you know, you're laying out, this is what mediation is. These are the things that we can discuss. You're making sure you've got the agency from the people that you're in your mediation, right? And then, you know, I think you have a brief discussion of you know, mediation is intended to resolve conflicts outside of court and, uh, you know, the alternative, it, it, if if you did end up in court, these are this is what that may look like. There is fee shifting. Um, the the eviction process is relatively quick, right? So that you have some of this information um, and background when you're going into these mediations with uh, tenants and landlords. So and also you know kind of laying that out for them so that they have that background as well, right? Because it, it, I think it is important to understand what the alternative is, right? If, if this fails, what's the alternative? What, what are we looking at? Are we looking at eviction court? Are we looking at suing the landlord? 
So what would be the alternative? And having that in in the party's minds when they go into the mediation can be really useful in terms of, again, keeping their perspective. Um, yeah, just you know, having some perspective about what what may happen if they don't they don't find that a find a find a solution. Again, I think that when you're not in court, the moral arguments seem a whole lot more important. Um, once you get to court, you know, court doesn't really care about those arguments so much, right? They care about the legal ones, and so um, so if you know when people have in the back of their mind that that court may be there and that legal arguments are going to be the ones that matter, not so much those moral ones, um, they often are a little bit more willing to to have the tough conversations or to you know compromise on some things. Right. I'm just going to check. So there's a question here that a difference between an HOA and a tenants committee. So an HOA, um, so a home, well, okay. So HOAs are generally for people who own brick and mortar homes, they own the property, right? That their home is seated on. Um, whereas a tenants committee is a law that is, you know, it is something that the law created and it's landlord tenant law created it, right? So it's um, under landlord tenant law, there is something called a tenant committee of seven that is specific to facility tenants, facility parks, right, facilities. So that's specific to the, the back end of the law, what we were talking about before, right, manufactured home parks, floating home arenas, people who own their home but rent the space that their home is sitting on. That's what a committee of seven is. Um, people call themselves all sorts of things. Theoretically, you know, a homeowner's associate, they're really not, it's really not a homeowner's association. Yes, they own their home, but they don't own the land that it's on. So it's not the same, um, it's just not the same mechanism, right? Like you're you're looking at a different, um, kind of different areas of the law, real property versus um, personal property. You know, it's just, it's a different, different ballpark, very similar idea, but different thing. Um, and the, you know, the law, the the rules and the the rights for a tenant committee of seven is laid out in ORS 90.600. The law, the landlord tenant law doesn't talk at all about HOAs. So HOAs is not something that the law even thinks about in terms of, of these tenancies, right? So when we're talking about a committee of seven, that is a committee of seven or less people who have been elected through a park-wide election um, where each rented space gets to cast one vote. Um, you know, there has to be a ballot, a box, there, you know, there's, the law is a little bit unclear about what exactly is required, but it's pretty clear that like, you need to have a clear ballot with the option to vote against forming a committee, right? I mean, like you, you need to hold a, a pretty good election, I would say. Um, now, what people call themselves, I don't know if that's super important, <laughs> um, right? So as long as they've held held the, the park-wide election, they have seven or less people, you know, they as long as they follow the steps that are laid out in 90.600, I think what they call themselves is irrelevant, right? So long as they, they fit the definition of a committee of seven. Um, but yeah, an HOA really... You're talking about people who own both the land and the home. Does that make sense, Brian? Okay. Perfect. All righty. And I'm sorry, if I'm not answering all the questions in the chat, um, please just feel free to raise your hand and uh, let me know. It's hard to see my, see everything at the same time. <laughs> all right. So we talked a bit about fee shifting. Um, the, the only thing that I'll really add is, um, is that 
legal aid lawyers um, can charge the landlord attorney's fees if they win in court as well. So um, just because a tenant may be low income and is likely not to, and likely will not be hiring their own attorney to go to court, um, that does not mean that they won't have an attorney. And that does not mean that the landlord won't be subject to paying attorney's fees, right? Um, legal aid lawyers, although we, you know, we don't charge our clients anything, right? We're free attorneys for our clients. Um, we charge this pretty much the standard like 75th percentile of fees for of average attorney's fees, right? So we're we're not that much cheaper than than uh, a landlord attorney would be either. Um, and so, you know, as we discussed, where you know, understanding that if you don't resolve your case outside of court, that court could mean you're paying the other side's attorney's fees. Um, you know, that is a consideration that landlords really do need to take to think about because um, even though it's unlikely that their tenants will hire an attorney on their own, they are likely to get uh, a legal aid attorney. And if if that tenant wins with a legal aid attorney, that landlord's still going to have a bill for a couple thousand dollars, right? So that that consideration still does come into to effect, even if it's a legal aid lawyer on the other side. Um, do, 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 do. Perfect. Oh, that's all I'm saying. All right. And again, so we talked, um, we talked a little bit about tenant committees already. Um, as I said, so the right to form the tenant committee is in ORS 90.600. Um, you have to hold a park-wide election. Each rented space gets only one ballot. Um, and seven or fewer people can be elected, no more than seven to the committee. Um, and this committee is intended to help facilitate communication and problem solving with the landlord. Um, the landlord is required to meet with the committee at least once a year. After that meeting, the committee is to send the landlord a letter that overviews what was talked about and the issues in the park and you know, proposing some solutions. And then the landlord is required to respond to that letter, um, addressing the tenant's concerns. Um, and that's really all that's required. So, so they're required to meet once, once a year, um, no more than twice a year. They are required to respond to the tenant's letter after the meeting that kind of reviews all the issues and they're re required to respond to that. Um, but that, that's all that the law really talks about in terms of tenant committees. Um, the, the, the right to form a tenant committee is under, like, like I said, 90.600. That's also the rent increase statute. It's a short statute. There's literally like a couple sentences about what, how to hold an election and what a committee of seven is and does. Um, so, you know, that is up a bit for interpretation. Um, again, we, you know, we talked a lot about this, that they can avail themselves of mandatory mediation if they, you know, if, if the yearly meeting and letters don't, don't resolve the issues. Um, but because mediation is voluntary, um, and it requires everybody to agree, there has to be really express agency, um, or permission for, for someone else to negotiate on behalf of other tenants. Um, and those tenants do need to be aware of and assent to the agreement um, if they're going to be bound by it. Um, again, best practice is to have that in writing, have everybody sign um, an agreement if that's what they want to do, because you know, as we talked about, it's it's very common for there to be kind of different cliques, different trend groups within these parks. And um, I, I can easily see a situation where um, most of the park likes the agreement, but some of the park doesn't. And if you don't have express permission, and if the tenant committee didn't, didn't have express permission to negotiate on behalf of that person, um, and that person didn't expressly agree to this, to the mediated agreement, um, they can certainly fight that, right? And if you don't have that in writing, then, um, then I think they've got a pretty good argument that they're not bound by it. Rent increases, again, we talked about this already, but it's 7% plus the CPI with a max of 10%. Um, 
Um, something that's important to note is that rent increase laws don't apply to new tenancies. Um, so, you know, if a tenant owner sells their home, right, maybe they, maybe it's time to move into kind of an assisted living area or something. Um, they sell their home when they, you know, when they were living there, say when they sold it, it was, their rent was $545 a month, right? So let's just say 500 because I'm bad at math. So 10% of 500 is 50 bucks, right? So, so, you know, theoretically, if that person's rent was 500, they would only, landlord would only be able to raise that person's rent up 50 bucks that next year. But because that person moved out and sold their home to a new tenant, the landlord can set the rent um, at the market rate when that new tenant moves in. So, you know, the, the rent increase law does not apply to different rental agreements, right? So tenant A has this rental agreement at 500 and then tenant B is moving into that home, that unit. Uh, landlord can charge tenant B $900 a month for rent, even though that's a $400 a month increase from what the rent was prior um, to what it is now, as long as it's in line with market rate, the landlord can do that. There are no rent increase um, caps in terms when you have a new tenant or a new rental agreement. Um, yeah. All right. So some rules and regulation or rights and obligations, excuse me, uh, <laughs> excuse me. So the tenant has to follow the terms of the rental agreement, obviously, and follow the rules and regulations. Um, if they don't do those things, the landlord can issue them a violation notice um, or a notice of termination for um, for the violation. Um, they, you know, if it's if it's stated in the rental agreement and allowed by ninety point three hundred two. They can charge fees for the violation, um, but generally they can't be charging a fee and evicting or, you know, and giving a termination notice at the same time, right? They got to pick one of those options. Um, in terms of the tenant's rent or duty to pay rent on time, um, landlords don't need to provide an invoice every month. They don't need to tell you what your space rent is every month. Your rent is due on the day that it says that it's due in the rental agreement, every month without question, that's when it's due, right? If you didn't pay it on that, pay it then, it's considered late, right? And generally a rental agreement will have terms about when something is considered late. Usually it's after the fifth day. Um, but again, that, that does not have to, they don't have to give you a piece of paper. They don't have to send you an email. They don't have to, give you a balance of what is owed, none of that, right? They just, have, you have to pay your rent on time every month. Um, now that is in contrast to utilities where the landlord is required to give you a written bill every month um, in order to charge you for utilities, right? Be and that, that makes sense, right? If you think about it logically, your rent amount doesn't change except for maybe once a year under a rent increase notice, your rent is always due at, on the same day, every single month or every couple of weeks, however your landlord sets it up, right? But that's all very clearly set out in your rental agreement um, when your rent is due. Now, how much your utilities are, well, that generally depends on usage, right? So landlords can bill for utilities in a variety of different ways. You know, they can have sub meters on each tenant space. They can do things pro rata where they're being billed from, billed by the provider for the whole part and dividing that up um, in a fair way but among tenants, right? But generally speaking, uh, you're gonna get a, a, a bill from the provider that is based on usage. The landlord will get a bill from the provider based on usage. So that bill is going to be changing every month. Rates change, usage changes, right? And so in order to require a tenant to pay utilities, um, we call it pass-through billing. So in order for the, the landlord to recoup utility costs from a tenant, um, they do have to provide a written bill. So in most parts, you will see monthly invoices that have both the rent amount and the utility amount on them. That is okay, as long as those things are separately stated. 
um, and the and there's no requirement that the tenant pay all of the pay both the utilities and the rent at the same time. Um, there can't be that requirement cannot exist, right? The, the duty to pay rent is a separate duty from your duty to pay your utilities and the consequences for not paying your rent is different than the consequences for not paying your utilities. So while the landlord can give you one bill with all of those charges on it, um, they cannot condition acceptance of rent on your payment of the utility bill. And I have seen some parks attempt to do that. Basically they say, you pay the entire invoice or we're not gonna accept your check. Um, that that really shouldn't be allowed, right? That they're they're separate payments. Um, they're just separate, separate consequences, separate everything. Um, um, and so something that is is important to to note when you're dealing with parks that are going through a utility billing change. So a lot of times parks, especially now, are switching over to sub meter billing. Um, this can get really expensive for tenants because they can recoup. Um, the cost of installing those submeters from tenants over the course of 60 months. Um, and so, you know, you might be having some issues, you're seeing some issues with um, with this conversion of rent utility billing method. Um, and one of the things that I've seen is that landlords during the transition period or while they're attempting to convert um, that they'll stop sending out the invoices because they're not charging tenants for a number of months while they're trying to either install the submeters or um, fix their bad billing method that they had before, right? Um, and so when that occurs, um, it's important that tenants know that they still have that duty to pay rent, that that duty to pay rent is separate. Even if you've gotten a, an invoice every single month of your tenancy and you've lived there for 20 years, and that always stated your rent amount and your utility amount. And then, you know, say January 1st, uh-oh, I don't get that invoice. So after 20 years of always paying my rent and utilities on time, I don't get an invoice. I don't know what my utilities are. And I don't pay my rent because I didn't get the invoice. You're now in violation, right? Because you didn't pay, pay your rent, even though it is a very reasonable thing to think. I've gotten an invoice every single month for 20 years. I've always paid on time, right? But that's still a violation. So it's important that tenants know that that, even if they're receiving a, a bill for their rent every month, that isn't required. And if they don't receive a bill, that doesn't mean that they don't have to pay their rent, right? They definitely still have to pay their rent. And if they don't, they can get evicted for that. Um, tenants also must report issues to park management. So if there are lights out, if there are, um, drainage problems, if there's something going on with the common area, um, those things need to be reported to park management. I always um, recommend doing that in writing. Uh, you know, an email is something you can print out and show to someone, uh, right? An email is something you can print out and take to court. And when you ask someone on the stand on, on you know, December 14th, did you attend the uh, X presentation, right? And if they're like, no, I, no, I didn't, then you can say, oh, well, excuse me there, Sam, I've got an email here that uh, you sent me that said, hey, I just attended this presentation, right? Great job. Did you write this, right? So you, it's a, it's a way that you can actually prove, prove that you've let them know that, that things need to occur, um, even when they might want to deny that that you did tell them that information, right? So putting things in writing is always best practice. Um, tenants also must maintain the condition of their manufactured home and maintain their rented space. Um, so landlords are required are allowed to enforce um, you know, disrepair and um, deterioration requirements for the home. Um, and landlords are, are allowed to require like landscaping and um, yard care and all of that kind of stuff. Um, what a landlord cannot do is require things to occur on the inside of the home. So um, the inside of the home, that's the tenant's domain. Uh, and, and the landlord, you know, really 
landlord number one can't come into the home for any reason other than to inspect for leaks and only in a very, very specific circumstance. Um, so really the inside of the home, that's the tenant's world. That's the, you know, that's the tenant's castle. If, you know, if you think about it in the way we think about property rights in, in America, you know, the home is, is your castle. Um, that's where a lot of our privacy rights stem from is the, the importance of the home um, and of the family in the home and being able to rule your own home. Um, and so we kind of think about that in this context as well. Tenants own these homes, right? And so we want to provide them with some of that, um, some of the level of, of those rights to privacy that um, other homeowners would have, right? Because we do in America really prioritize the, the power of the home and the, the need for or privacy within the home. So landlords must also follow the terms of the rental agreement. Um, they must also maintain some of the rented space, vacant spaces, common areas, in a habitable condition. Um, so basically what habitable means or what uninhabitable means is, you know, are there hazard trees? So a hazard tree is a tree that has been deemed hazardous by an arborist. Right. So if you ever have a question is, is this a hazard tree? You need to call an arborist um, and get them to come out and do an inspection of the tree. Um, they are also responsible for issues with the connection to water or electricity or gas, if that's provided on the rented space. Like we talked about, again, though, the, the rented space really is the tenant's domain. So if it's past that connection, um, that's gonna be fall under the tenant's responsibility. So it's up to the connection um, on the rented space is the landlord's responsibility. And that includes any submeter. So if the landlord installed submeters on the space, they would be responsible for that as well. Landlords must also provide notices, um, uh, proper valid notices that are in alignment with the law um, for any proposed rule changes, for any rent increases, um, and for any termination notices. So, um, and they also need to provide notice to enter. We talked about that a little bit as well. Um, the exception to providing the notice to enter is if they're coming onto the space to deliver a notice, right? So if one of these other notices that they're going to give you or a notice to enter, they're going to give you a notice to enter. Well, they can't give you that before they gave it to you, right? So they're allowed to come on to give notices and they're allowed to come on once a month to read your submeter if you have a submeter um, without giving any notice, right? Uh, landlords are also required to provide a receipt for rent payments, but only when requested by the tenant. What's become tricky about this um, is, you know, the law allows a tenant to condition their payment of rent on the receipt uh, on getting a receipt, but if you're paying your rent uh, either by electronic means or by check and check and mail, um, you can't really condition your payment on getting a receipt because there's no one there to give you a receipt, right? So that that term is literally so when you go into the office, you can say to the manager, "Here's my rent, but you need to give me a receipt. I'm not going to give you my rent check until you give me the receipt." Um, but you can't really do that some well when you're mailing something, right? And so um, there's a little bit of confusion about exactly how to force a landlord to provide those rent receipts um, when they are, when when rent is being paid by mail. Um, but that is something that the, the landlord's required to do when requested by the tenant. So we're talking a little bit about rule changes, um, modifications to the rental agreement. So generally speaking, there's no unilateral changes to the rental agreement, meaning the landlord can't just on a whim decide that they're going to change um, something that the landlord and the tenant had already previously agreed to. Um, again, remember, we're working with contracts here, and contracts are all about a meeting of the minds of two people coming together and making an agreement that will um, benefit both parties, right? The reason why you're not allowed to change a change a contract like that by yourself is because one of those terms may have been the reason why you agreed to it, right? So when we're talking about material changes, significant changes, things that if it wasn't in there or if it was in there, you wouldn't have signed, right? So 
So we want to avoid that kind of a change. However, um, you know, the law changes pretty fast, specifically with landlord tenant laws. Uh, we saw that really during COVID, right? Where we were, we were having new law all the time. Um, and so rental agreements do need to be updated to reflect changes in the law, right? So that they stay current and stay legal. Um, and, um, you know, we want to allow landlords to increase rent, which that, again, that's a term, an important term of a rental agreement, right? How much you're going to pay for it. And so, so there are some things that we allow a landlord to unilaterally change in a rental agreement. So, um, like, again, to, to comply with the law, a change in the law, um, to allow service by post and mail. So, you know, when you serve someone under the law, generally speaking, you're, we're talking about personal service or service by first class mail. Um, landlord tenant law does allow landlords to serve by first class mail and post a copy of the notice on the tenant's door. And when they do that, they don't have to add an additional three days to the service timeline. So they're allowed to change that. Um, they're allowed to impose fees as long as those fees are allowed under 90.302. And if they want to impose new fees that are allowed under that statute, they have to give a 90 day notice. Um, landlords are allowed to convert the utility billing method um, unilaterally. Again, there's an extensive process that's required um, and that process is different depending on whether you're converting from rent included or pro rata and whether you're converting to sub meter or pro rata or direct billing, right? So the rules are slightly different, um, but they are, landlords are allowed to convert uh, utility billing methods on their own or without you know the acceptance from the tenant, but they do have to, again, you know, provide a notice, hold a meeting, provide uh, handouts, all sorts of different things. Um, that there's quite a few requirements in order for them to change that utility billing method. Um, and again, like we talked about, landlords are allowed to increase the rent. Um, so changes to rules and regulations, we're looking here at 90.610. So landlords are allowed to change the rules and regulations in the park. Um, however, they have to get the tenant's consent. Um, and it's not getting each individual tenant's consent, but rather it's holding a park-wide vote. Similarly to the tenant committee vote, um, tenants have to, each rented space gets only one vote. So one ballot per rented space, not per tenant. Um, if 51% of tenants uh, or more 51, if 51 percent or more of <laughs> tenants vote no, uh, then the change, the rule changes don't take uh, don't take effect. Um, the there's a a specific process and timeline that's laid out in 90.610, um, but ex essentially what it is is that um, 60 days before a rule change will take effect, you hand out this notice that basically says, hey, I'm your landlord. I want to change the rules and regulations. This is the old rule. This is the new rule. Here's a little blurb about what changes between the old rule and the new rule. Um, you have the right to vote against this. Um, here's a ballot. You have to return it within 30 days. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you don't say, if you don't cast your ballot in 30 days, then that counts as agreeing to the rule change. Um, and so then tenants, you know, in the park have those, that 30 days from the day, you know, notice given, 60 day notice given, 30 days start clicking. Once 30 days is over, if tenants, if 51% or more did not vote no, then at the end of the 60 days, um, that, that rule will take effect. If at that time, um, if at 30 days, 51% or more did vote no, then the process is done, it's been cast down, no rule change. Um, one of the interesting things here that may come up, um, I know that pets are super important to people and um, landlords, there's kind of a trend moving away from allowing pets or if they are allowing only small ones or only cats or things like that or limiting the amount of pets you may have. 
Um, and so an important note is that if a landlord, you know, if pets are allowed in the park and a tenant has a pet that is legally allowed under the rental agreement, um, and then the landlord uses this process to change the rules where that pet would no longer be allowed, either or breed or size restriction or number or whatever. Um, so long as they were they were legally allowed under the prior rule, a new rule change can't require that tenant to get rid of their pet, right? So if you you have that pet already, um, the rule changes under that rule, you wouldn't be able to have that pet. Doesn't matter, you still get to have the pet. And if that pet dies, you're allowed to replace that pet with a similar pet, right? So under that same rule. So you're basically like grandfathering that that pet into, um, into your rental agreement. Um, so even though the rules and regulations changed, you're always gonna be allowed to have that type size of pet, even if it's not the same specific pet. The law treats animals as property. I don't agree with that. I love my animals. They're more like family and they're not replaceable by just the another size or or breed right but um but that is how the law the law treats it um another important thing to know is that landlords cannot require tenants to sign new rental agreements so there's only one circumstance in which a landlord can do that and it is if a tenant is on a fixed term rental agreement and the landlord provides them a new rental agreement 60 days before the expiration of their current one and um, that that agreement is contains only reasonable changes. Um, then the then the tenant has to sign that you know within thirty days, or their rental agreement will terminate at the end of the sixty days. So that's literally the only time that 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 the, the, the landlord can require a tenant to sign a new rental agreement or make the tenant move out. Right. So it's if you're on a two year rental agreement that ends on December 31st, then you know your landlord in at the beginning of November or the end of, of January or at the end of October would have needed to give you a new, give you a copy of the new rental agreement, give you a piece of paper that explains this is a new rental agreement. You have 30 days to sign this rental agreement. If you don't sign this rental agreement, your rental agreement will terminate at the end of that two years. So at the on December 31st, right? So at the end of your fixed term, it'll just expire if you don't sign the new one. That's the only time that you can do that, that a landlord can require that or require someone to move out. Um, in all other circumstances, a tenant can just refuse to sign an agreement. If a landlord tries to make them sign it, tenant does not have to do that. They, there's no requirement that a tenant sign a new rental agreement or be required to move out, um, except again, in this very specific circumstance, and that's um, in 90.545. Um, yeah, so oh, looks like you have a question. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> All right, um, and so, so yeah, I think that that, that, that kind of covers it. Um, again, you know, if, if landlords want to change the rules, if landlords want to change utility billing, raise the rent, um, impose new fees, those things are allowed, um, but they have to follow the process that's in that you know is laid out in the law. They can't just say, "Hey, here's a new rental agreement. You have to sign it. It contains all these new rules and regulations." That's really that's what the law is trying to disallow is um, putting a tenant in a situation where you know, they're pretty stuck in the park, right? Once you've moved your manufactured home into a park, you're pretty much stuck there. It's incredibly expensive, um, if even possible, to move your home once you've seated it. Um, and frankly, a lot of these homes are pretty old and the structural integrity would not survive a move, right? So, um, so you, they're pretty stuck in there, right? And so the law really wants to protect tenants from being forced to sign a new rental agreement um, that they didn't really agree to because what bargaining power do you have when you can't move your home, it's stuck in this space and your landlord's requiring you to sign a new rental agreement, you you have no bargaining power. That's not, you know, that's not how we, I, the idea of contracts, right? The idea of contracts is that everyone has 
a right to enter into contracts of their own volition, right? And um, and a right to negotiate those contracts. And you really have no right to negotiate it or really even to decide to enter it um, if your landlord is saying, sign this or move, right? You're Because moving really means selling your house at the end of the day. Um, so it, it's that's why the, the law is written like this. Um, and so if, if you were on a fixed term rental agreement and say your landlord didn't give you that notice 60 days in advance, they only did it 30 days or they forgot to do it all together, your rental agreement automatically converts to a month to month rental agreement. So even though your rental, your fixed term rental agreement says it expires on December 31st, 2023, um, on January 1st, 2024, that rental agreement is now a month to month rental agreement rather than a fixed term rental agreement, right? So month to month rental agreements renew automatically every single month until terminated um, validly under the law. So that requires pause, right? A landlord can't just terminate um, a facility tenant for no reason. So, so it, these are really good, important protections for tenants particularly because when you're thinking about that bargaining power and um, and you know the ability to really negotiate a contract, tenants are in a pretty crappy situation um, once they've already moved in and sided their house there because they're pretty much stuck in that park uh, with that landlord. Um, so, so again, yeah, it's really important that we know that tenants do not have to uh, agree to changes and that if landlords want to do changes, they have to follow a very specific legal process. And if they don't follow that process, then those changes are not effective and not enforceable. All right, so we're just gonna briefly grow, go. Oh, okay, so could landlords then submit notice anytime? No, so month to month, automatically renews every single month. It automatically renews. Um, you have to terminate a a month to month agreement under the law. So using a termination notice um, and the eviction process, right? And so that, you know, those are for specific things, right? Uh, you, there are no terminations without cause in, in the back end, really. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, they could give you a notice during your fixed term, the same as they could give you a notice during your month to month. There's no such thing as a no, uh, no cause notice in this in this circumstance, right? So your landlord can't just evict you for no reason. There has to be a reason for the, for evicting you. Does that make sense, Andrea? Did I answer your question, or did you have another? Um, I guess I meant for the notice for uh, new rental agreements. So, so no. So once the, so a new rental agreement, they have to do that 60 days before the fixed term expires, mm -hmm. at least 60 days. So if they, if it's 59 days, they're out of luck, right? Then, then the rental agreement is going to automatically convert to a month to month agreement. And then that month to month agreement continues to renew every single month automatically until it's and until like a landlord or a tenant terminates it either okay. for cause or because the tenant wants to move out. Okay, so then those that prior agreement is fixed in place. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and so basically once that prior agreement is uh is fixed in place, the only way that the landlord can adjust that agreement is through the, the rule change process through one of the you know, unilateral amendment statutes. But again, th there's a whole process that they have to follow for those as well. Um, and generally, you know, apart from some of those unilateral ones, tenants do still have the opportunity to, to vote it down, which okay. is nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, so the eviction process. So the eviction process starts out with a termination notice. Um, that's kind of what we've been discussing, right? So, um, they have to serve this termination notice on you. Um, the termination notice has to state the violation um, generally with some specificity, right? So it can't just be like, you're loud, 
like, okay, what? <laughs> what do you mean I'm loud? How am I supposed to defend an eviction on the on the claim that I'm loud, right? Like it needs to say on September 22nd, 2023 at 10 24 p.m. you screamed obscenities at your neighbor when the management came over to tell you to stop you screamed at them and threatened to throw your shoe at them or something right I mean whatever it is but um so it needs to be relatively specific it can't just be these like super broad causes that you can't pinpoint on a you know on a calendar or actually be able to describe or explain like if you just tell someone they're loud well when was I loud how was I loud how am I supposed to go to court and defend myself to say I wasn't loud when I don't even know what you're talking about, right? So, um, so the, you know, there's that specificity argument there as well. Um, there's a notice period. So when you get the termination notice, you'll have the service date on it, and then you'll have, um, generally, you'll have a cure date on it, and then a termination date on it. Um, so the cure date is usually... For the back end, the cure date and the um, termination date are usually the same. Usually you have 30 days. So if we're talking about just general conduct, something that a tenant has done, um, like they haven't mowed their lawn, they haven't, uh, they've got a bunch of crap in their carport that's not supposed to be there. They can get a termination notice for that that will say on the top, 30 day termination notice for cause. And it needs to explain on there, according to your rental agreement, you have agreed to not keep crap in your carport on this date, this date, and this date, management witnessed, you know, boxes, a broken down car, three bicycles, yada, yada, in your carport, um, you know, in order to avoid termination and maintain your tenancy, you need to remove said boxes and bicycles and broken car and yada yada from your carport by this date right and so that's generally 30 days from the date of service to the date of termination and cure um and if you do what they've asked you to do in that notice before that cure date before the termination date then your um uh, then your your rental agreement does not terminate and you continue your tenancy there and your landlord cannot file an eviction against you based on that termination notice. And if they do file an eviction against you based on that termination notice, then you have an eviction or then you have a defense to that eviction, um, a factual defense based on the fact that you did cure, that you did what they said to do in the notice to avoid termination. And now they're claiming that you're terminated so that's your defense, right? Is that, no, I did what they told me to do to avoid termination. If you don't do the tasks by the cure date, um, then your rental agreement is considered terminated on that termination date. After that termination date, your landlord is allowed to file the notice and a complaint with the court and start what we call an FED, a forcible entry and detainer, which is an eviction case, essentially. Um, your landlord can't file this notice with the court until after that notice expires, right? So what triggers them to be able to file the eviction complaint is that you are staying in the home after your rental agreement has been terminated, right? So that termination date passing is, that's key to, to having a terminated rental agreement and having uh, you know a claim, uh, a land, the landlord having a claim for possession. Um, so once that notice expires, say tenant did not clean up the carport, tenant did not move out on the termination date. Um, termination date was December 31st. It's now January, let's say second, because probably closed on the first. Um, your landlord goes to the court, files that complaint, attaches their notice, and then they have to serve you a copy of that complaint. Generally, that's done by mail. Um, then the court, once that's in the, the court system, the court will mail you a summons that contains a copy of the complaint and the notice, and um, and the summons will tell you, you know, what courtroom, what day, what time you need to be at court to attend a first appearance. 
Um, the first appearance is really just a check-in with the court. You're not having a trial. You're not discussing the facts of the case with the court at first appearance. Um, generally, what the judges do at first appearance is you know, give a give a spiel to all of the parties that are there. It, it's what we call a cattle call docket. It's a terrible name, um, but it's there's lots of people are coming. Generally, you're going to have anywhere from like 10 to 30 cases on that docket. So it'll be a big full courtroom. Um, the, the judge will kind of do a, a big spiel overview of what, you know, how this process works, what the options are today at first appearance, um, what the consequences can be if you go to trial, including attorney's fees, um, being removed by the sheriffs, an eviction judgment against you, all that kind of stuff. And then they'll give you three options. They'll say, you can, today you can either settle your case you can request trial or you can concede the eviction. Conceded, the, conceding the eviction just means that you agree that you got a, um, a, termination, a valid termination notice, you didn't do the cure and you didn't move out. And so you're just agreeing that like, yep, I am evicted. You can evict me. And then the judge will enter an eviction against you. So not a great option. Um, you can also request trial. Uh, if you request trial, um, depending on the type of eviction that you have, um, your trial will be set anywhere between two to 14 days out, or excuse me, usually it's two to seven days out. Um, but if it's a non-payment case, I believe they're setting those out 14 days, I want to say. Um, so for non-payment cases, they do have a slightly longer timeline between um, you know, filing the complaint, complaint and your first appearance, that's, uh, I believe, 21 days for non-payment, whereas it's 14 days for uh, any other case. Um, and then, and the reason why we're doing that is because there are rental assistance programs out there, and we want to give um, those programs, we want to give tenants enough time to get their application in, to get the information from the landlord, and get those amounts paid um, before the trial date, because the new law does allow tenants to what we call cure, right, to, to avoid eviction by paying the non-payment amount all the way up until that day of trial. So you can't do it after, you know, trial started and it's clear you're going to lose. You can't just decide to pay right then, right? It has to be before your trial starts. Um, but you do have that opportunity to avoid eviction um, by paying the back due amount on a non-payment um, on a non-payment eviction all the way up until trial. And so that's why we have a little bit longer timelines in terms of scheduling each court date uh, for those non-payment cases, just to allow a little bit more time for those rent assistance applications to process and get paid before the trial date. Um, often, if you're gonna settle your case, um, I don't know if any of you guys have done this, um, but there are, Different circuit courts do it differently in Oregon, but some circuit courts actually have uh, mediators on hand uh, that, that are there and will sit down with tenants and will medi help mediate um, agreements. Um, others you know, will just kind of tell you, go out in the hallway and talk to your landlord and see if you can come up with an agreement. Um, if an agreement is reached, then the parties will write that down on a, a specific form and give that to the court. And then the court will end up actually entering that settlement agreement as a court order. Um, and if the if that order, if the agreement is not followed, so say tenant had to pay a certain amount by a certain date and didn't do that, or tenant agreed to stop yelling at the manager, right? And then tenant does it. So they violate the stipulated agreement. The, the landlord is allowed to file a notice of non-compliance with the court and the court then in a pretty quick turnaround, I believe it's about four days, will enter a judgment of eviction against that tenant. Um, the tenant does have a, a right to contest the notice of non-compliance, go to court and explain that they did comply and that landlord is mistaken, that they did pay that money by that date or they didn't actually yell at the landlord, right? But that's the the extent of that hearing. So while settling cases with these court orders is really appealing because the other op op options are getting evicted right then and there or requesting trial, 
Um, they can be really dangerous because if people are agreeing to things that they can't actually follow through with, um, they're going to get evicted anyways, right? And they're not even going to have an opportunity to go to trial um, on, the, on the issue. They're just going to pretty much get evicted. So, so settling cases at first appearance is a great option for tenants, but tenants really do need to understand the the strictness of these agreements and the process by which a landlord can get an eviction under this agreement very quickly and without addition without additional notice to the tenant. Um, so if you request trial, you have to file an answer that day. An answer is what it sounds like. You're responding to the complaint. Um, so you're laying out your defenses, your you know, stating that you think you have damages or counterclaims, um, and then, you know, requesting fees. Um, once, so the judge will set the trial date. Generally, they'll do that during the first appearance while they're sitting on the bench. And then after that, you'll go, the tenant will draft an answer, file the answer with the clerks of the court, um, and then we'll come back for their trial date. Um, trial is like any civil trial. You call witnesses, you put on a case, um, it's the plaintiff's burden of proof. So that's that's the landlord's got to prove the prove the case. Um, they put on their case first and then the tenants will put on their case second. Um, there are lots of different defenses that tenants can raise, anything from a notice defense, meaning they got the, the form of the notice wrong, um, to a factual defense, meaning the underlying facts that they're alleging are just not true. Um, and they can also do counterclaims. So, you know, if say your landlord had ha, landlord had done an unlawful entry, they entered the rented space three times last month um, without notice. And it wasn't just to read the sub meter, right? Or provide a notice. It was, they were coming onto your space and knocking on your door and trying to talk to you. Um, and they did that three times last month. Well, you can make three counterclaims for three unlawful entries in that answer as well. Um, and in that case, then you're going to have the burden of proof for proving that those entries did occur, right? So if you're the one that is alleging a violation of the law, you're the one that's going to have the burden of proving that violation. So for the, the eviction, that's going to be the landlord's responsibility. They need to prove that they did it right and that you actually did do the thing they're evicting you for. And then if you're making a counterclaim, you're going to have to prove that they really did the thing that you're counterclaiming for. Um, trial can be set any 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 time between like two days to fourteen days after your first appearance. So requesting trial at your first appearance isn't necessarily going to give you a longer timeline in the house. Um, it just really depends on the capacity of the court and how many cases are moving through the system at a time. Uh, each court is different across the state, but most of the time they're only taking anywhere between like two to four landlord tenant trials a day. Whereas, like I said, the, the first appearance docket can be sometimes 30 people, 30 cases on it, right? So um, so the, you, they do have to spread out those trials uh, over a period of time and that may get you out a few days or it might get you in a few days earlier than you would like, right? So when you go to first appearance, you need to, understand what your defenses are if you have any and you need to um you know be ready to go to trial right you don't want to go to first appearance and not have any idea uh what your defense would be or what your evidence would be right because it's going to be a pretty quick turnaround you're not going to have a whole lot of time to prepare for trial after that first appearance um if you lose at trial um the court will enter in a judgment of eviction and then the landlord has to obtain a writ of execution from the court and give that to the sheriff's office. Um, and then the sheriff will execute. Generally, the sheriff will go out and post the writ of execution um, pretty quickly after they receive it from the landlord. Um, that writ will explain that they have about 72 hours to remove their things from the property or the sheriff will come back and escort them off. And then at the end of those four days or you know, 72 hours, the, when the sheriffs come back, um, then they will remove the person from the home. Um, generally, they give them about 15 minutes or so to collect their personal belongings and get ready to um, and, and, and leave the home. 
Um, and also if you lose, we've talked about this quite a bit, but you'll likely be required to pay for your landlord's costs and fees. That includes attorney's fees, um, which can, can be expensive. But again, on the flip side, if you go to trial and you win, your landlord will have to pay your attorney's fees. Um, and while that's not like a super great benefit to tenants who are using legal aid lawyers, because it's already free for them, um, what it really does is just add an incentive for the landlord to come to a better agreement with the tenant, right? Because if they come to an agreement, then they don't have to pay thousands of dollars in fees. If they don't come to an agreement, then they do, right? So it, it, it's still a good bargaining tool, um, even though if it's not a direct benefit to tenants if they're not not already paying for an attorney, right? Sure, yes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different types of evictions. So we've got non-payment of rent, 90.394. Um, and then, and that's pretty straightforward, right? If you don't pay your rent by the eighth day of the rental period, then your landlord can give you a um, non-payment of rent termination notice. Um, that has to be 10 days and uh, allow you to pay your rent within those 10 days or uh, and avoid termination. At the end of those 10 days, your landlord can, if you haven't paid, your landlord can file this eviction against you in court using the process we discussed about in the previous slide. Um, but again, like we discussed, there is a new law that allows tenants to avoid eviction for non-payment of rent. So long as they pay the amount stated in that notice before their trial begins. Um, so that's really the non-payment is the one caveat of, of the law that if you can still avoid eviction um, by right, by curing the notice um, once you're in court. Non-payment is the only type of eviction where that is the case. Um, everywhere else, it's not a right. Um, your landlord would have to agree to it and either agree to dismiss or enter a settlement agreement with you. Um, to, to resolve and uh, to avoid eviction for any other type of cause. Um, violations of the rental agreement rules or laws. So these would be a 30 day violate, a 30 day termination notice, and that would be issued under 90.630. Um, violations of the rental agreement can really be anything from having an unauthorized pet to failing to maintain your lawn to screaming at your neighbors, to speeding through the park, to um, failing to pay your utility bill, all sorts of things like that. Um, again, you need to give them 30 days to cure the violation. So, you know, if, if their lawn is, is, has not been maintained or, you know, they've been doing, they've been exhibiting bad behavior, um, you know, there, there needs to be a section of that notice that is the cure section that explains what they need to do to fix the situation and avoid eviction, right? So if it's that the lawn is not being taken care of, well, you need to take care of the lawn, right? So you need to, you need to mow the lawn, you need to water your lawn, you need to fertilize, whatever it is that they think you need to do. They need to explain to you what needs to be done to fix it. Um, and then again, as long as you do that in 30 days, you'll avoid that eviction. If you don't, um, if you don't do it in the 30 days, they can file against you. And under the violations section, you do not have the right to cure once it's been filed. That requires the landlord settling with you, right? Um, Another thing you can be evicted for is the condition of your manufactured home. This is in regards to the outside of the home. Um, and in regards to repair, disrepair and um, deterioration only, um, you cannot be evicted for aesthetic concerns about your manufactured home. So the color of your home or the type of flowers you have or um, your lawn ornaments or whatever it is, right? That, that kind of stuff, you cannot be evicted for that. Um, the condition of the manufactured home really means disrepair and deterioration. So 
you know, if you haven't painted anything at all, right? Paint is important in terms of um, the longevity and structural integrity for wood um, and other types of um, like vinyl products, right? And so that could be something that they could require of you is to, to, to paint in general, right? To paint your home, to paint the siding. Um, if you have thing, you know, if your carport is falling apart or your roof is caving in, if things are occurring that you can see from the outside that is needs to be repaired or is deteriorating, those are things that your landlord can require you to do. Now, this type of a notice is issued under 90.632. And this type of notice requires at least 60 days for the tenant to be able to cure the notice, right? If the condition of, if they're requiring you to paint, but they've given you this notice in November, well, let's be honest, you can't paint the outside of your house between November and January in Oregon. It's raining <laughs> and cold, right? That's not going to work. And so there is a, a provision of the law that you can request um, extensions to this timeline, particularly if those extensions, or particularly if the repair or um uh, you know, renovation that is being required is going to be impacted by the weather, the time of year, uh, the materials that are needed, those types of things, right? So if, you know, during COVID, for example, the, the supply chain was really terrible and it was almost impossible to hire a contractor or get the parts that you needed, right? So if you got uh, an eviction notice for something, you made the call, you attempted to resolve the eviction, um, but you know, you're on a wait list, you literally cannot get someone out there to do the work that needs to get done, or you can't get that part. That's, that's kind of what this provision is for, for you to then, you know, take that to the, your landlord, say, hey, I need an extension on this. Um, it's just not possible for me to do it in this time frame. Um, repeat violations. So there are two types of repeat violations. One is a three strikes, the three strikes law for non-payment of rent, right? So that is if during a 12 month period, you have received a notice of termination for non-payment of rent three times that either with that third notice of termination for non-payment of rent or after that third notice, your landlord can issue a three strikes notice a termination notice that is not curable. So that means that you don't have the right to pay your back due amount and avoid eviction. Um, those notices, the notices of termination that were issued previously do have to contain a warning that says, if you receive three of these within a calendar year, you know, issued with the third one can be a repeat notice, a three strikes notice that is not curable. So there has to be a warning in at least two of those prior notices. Um, and again, it's not just making a late payment. Um, you actually have to receive a notice of non-payment uh, or termination notice for non-payment of rent in each one of those instances for the three strikes law to apply. Um, in terms of the violation, uh, or the other one, oh yeah, go ahead, Rick. Oh, I'm just uh, wanted to bring up that we're at time, and I want to make sure that, that uh, just trying to be sensitive to everybody else's time. And uh, I know you're kind of finishing on that up that, but just wanted to uh, bring that to your attention. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm just trying to answer some of the questions in the chat uh, while finishing up this slide about repeat violations, and I believe this is my last slide, so um, I'm happy to to, oh, no. So I guess here we can just speak about this. Um, so there's the two things, three strikes is for non-payment of rent, repeat violation is for like conduct violations or rental agreement violations, right? So um, the 20 day notice for repeat violations is not used for non-payment of rent. The three strikes law is used for non-payment of rent. Um, this is just say, essentially saying if you got a 30-day notice for cause, so, you know, 
the one of the notices under 90.630 um, that within the next, the fall, and you cure it, right? So we had a lawn issue, we fixed the lawn issue, didn't terminate the rental agreement, we're good to go. Um, but then four months later, I stopped watering my lawn again, and I stopped mowing my grass again. And then my landlord could give me a notice of terminate, a repeat notice of termination um, for you know, failure to maintain my lawn because that was within six months of that previous termination notice that mm. I did cure, right? So basically the reason for the repeat violation statute is that we don't, yes, we want to give tenants the opportunity to cure these types of violations and maintain their tenancies and can, you know continue on. But at the same time, if they're continuously doing the same violation over and over and over again, um, we want to give landlords an opportunity to get that person out. And so that's the that's what the repeat violation is for. It does have that six month time frame. Um, and it is used when previously in the last six months someone had cured um a notice, a violation notice, um, and now is doing the same violation again. Are there private? Jack, could you maybe ask your question? I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure I understand. Violations yeah, for repeat, sorry, and violations for repeat violations have to be the same. It has to be the same violation. Yeah, not, not a problem. So uh, my question was, at first appearance, um, if a tenant shows up with cash in hand for the notice amount, can the property management or their attorney refuse that at that point and say like, yeah. hey, I'm not the person who takes this, so we need to still set it, we still need to set a date or we need to uh, do a stipulated agreement? I would say no, that they can't, that they, I would say that they have to accept it at that time. So sure you're not sending your accountant to court but that's not really like it, the accountant isn't the person who is entitled to rent right your landlord is and your landlord is sending an agent to court so you can't i mean i think it's kind of a little bs if you ask me to, to say you know i mean to be like i don't we don't have the the right to accept your rent like i think a judge would be like hmm, okay you know what i mean <laughs> so i mean i would suggest that if, if that does occur you're at first appearance you have the money i would um recommend saying that when the judge calls the case right so there'll be a, the record will be turned on the judge will call the case parties will stand up usually they'll ask the plaintiff what's going on and then they'll ask the defendant what they want to do and then the tenant in that time should just be like your honor, I have the full amount of the, the, the full amount listed on the non-payment notice. Um, I have it in cash in this envelope right here with me. I would like to tender this payment to the landlord. And so then it's on the record, right? And so if landlord's like, oh no, you have to give that to my accountant or you have to send that to Colorado or whatever the hell they want to do. Um, then generally a judge would be like, that's not, take the damn money. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, it, it depends on who your judge is, but I would generally just recommend that if that that is the case put it on the record that they have the money and that they're attempting to tender the payment at that time um and then it's a part of your court record and there's just really no arguing with it um there is a you know there's a requirement in the new law that landlords participate in rental assistance applications and if they fail to participate then that's a defense to the eviction so i can't imagine like you know i can't imagine a circumstance where the judge would be willing to set a case out for trial when, you know, the money is right there and landlords just refusing to accept it. Right. I think that, again, that's a similar situation where that would be a defense to the eviction because <laughs> I have the money right here. Like, what do you mean? I'm allowed to pay it up until trial and it's first appearance. So take my money. Uh, and then the court should just go ahead and dismiss. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And do, is there any other questions here? Yeah. Don, Don had a question there. Yeah, hi. hi. I have a question about enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say 
the situation is a manufactured home park. There's more than enough uh, units involved. And the landlord wants to initiate the mediation, but the resident slash tenant refuses. Who, how does enforcement occur? So enforcement in terms of landlord-tenant law is all civil enforcement, meaning it goes through civil courts. So, you know, there are no, there's not an enforcement agency, OHF, OHCS is not an enforcement enforcement agency, neither is MMCRC, right? So generally, generally speaking, I mean, you the landlord would then take that person to court and, and compel them to participate in mediation, right? Or or vice versa. So um uh the you know if the landlord's refusing to engage you know, the tenant could, you know, ask MMCRC to send a letter and let, be a part of that process, right? Um, but generally speaking, the, all, the only enforcement mechanism for all of landlord-tenant law is civil court. Um, and if you're looking for a, for a judge to tell a landlord to do something, like, or not do something, well, that is, um, that's different than, like, a monetary award, right? So if, if tenants are just looking to receive damages, they could go to small claims court, which is okay. a little bit easier. Landlord, of course, can remove that and bring it back to civil regular circuit court. But um, but if you're asking for a judge to like say, landlord, you're not allowed to do that anymore, um, that would have to be in circuit court. Let, let, let's change the scenario slightly, that it's tenant to tenant. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, under mandatory mediation, those those two tenants do have to come together. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Okay. Yes. And if one refuses, there's that opportunity in small claims or whatever. Yeah, and you know, I think also right. depending on what how the the rental agreement is drafted, right? Um, all rental agreements for these situations have to have a provision about mandatory yes. mediation. So generally mm -hmm. speaking, failing to engage in that mediation um, would be a violation of the rental agreement. Um, so the landlord theoretically could issue a termination notice, a 30 day termination notice for cause for a conduct termination notice, right? For failing to follow that provision of the rental agreement that requires them to engage in the process. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a little bit harder for tenants because landlords get the FED process, which is expedited. It's fast, right? Um, small claims is slightly faster, but civil court is just takes forever, man. I mean, it's you file your complaint, you have 30 days to to do a response. I mean, you're looking eight months, a year, two years, maybe. It just really, really kind of depends. So. Um, landlords definitely have the upper hand with being able to prevail, use, use the FED courts. It looks like Jared has a question as well. Yeah, I was hoping to get some clarification about that 30-day timeline, because I've heard it described in different ways. Is it 30 days to have, like mediation needs to occur within 30 days, or just needs to be on the calendar at some point, and it was placed on the calendar six months in the future, but it got placed on the calendar within 30 days? Or it's simply just they responded, like you made contact within 30 days? That's a good question. I think that the requirement is responding. I don't think that the requirement is actually engaging in the mediation. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and stop sharing for one second and pull up the law really fast. Yeah, I mean, I think because because the it's impossible to really determine what availability the mediators are going to have and when you can get in and you know, when people are available. I don't think that 
a requirement that actually requires the mediation to occur in that time is makes sense. But let me okay. just double check what the what the language says. So yeah, it just says. So participating in mediation means making a good faith effort to schedule mediation within 30 days after mediation is initiated, attending and participating and cooperating with reasonable requests. So you know, I guess that really is very unclear to me as well. Um, okay. I think I think what they're saying is to try to schedule it within 30 days. So like actually get the mediation on the cat like it should be scheduled within that 30 day timeline. Um, but again, that's a good faith effort. So um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's not like a hard and fast rule there. It, okay. it, it's more like if nothing has happened in 30 days, then we're probably looking at a violation here, right? If, if people have been calling mediation places, attempting to reach out to, to different mediators and, and get something on the books and it's just not happening. There's schedule conflicts or whatever. And, you know, we're look we're, the mediation doesn't get scheduled for 60 days out. I think that you're still in a fine, you know, I, th I think that that's still fine. I don't think that that's a violation because it's that good faith effort to get it scheduled within the 30 days that is the requirement. So not really, I, I think that when it is actually scheduled is not super relevant to the analysis. It's more so like what efforts were made to get it scheduled in that time frame. Okay. And, and another question I have is I had either heard or read this somewhere. If somebody doesn't participate in mandatory mediation, uh, the it's like one month's rent worth of damages is the entitlement. Okay. And is there, and I don't know if this is a question you know, or if MMCRC has this, is there a resource to send people to? So somebody initiates mediation, it doesn't happen. Um, they want to seek those damages or whatever. Uh, you know, like MMCRC can't do that on behalf of somebody, but do they have, would they be able to point somebody in the right direction? So I would recommend, um in that circumstance to refer to an attorney probably. Um, okay. Now, and like I mentioned at the beginning, there are legal aid offices all around the state of Oregon serving every county. And so that's probably your best bet, go refer to local legal aid. If the tenant is over that pretty like low poverty threshold for regular legal aid, then that's something that you could um, refer them to me because I have a higher threshold, financial threshold for my grant. Um, and then also the Oregon State Bar has a modest means referral program where um, you can fill out a referral request and they'll send you, you know, they'll give you a name of a person and it's $30 for your first initial consultation with that attorney. Um, but then after that initial consultation, then you have to like come up with your own fee arrangement with that attorney. But it is a way to, to be able to get in, um, get some legal advice there. Um, and yes. Thank you. Thank you. So damages don't have to be done in small claims. Um, small claims is a court that damages can be received from, um, but you can absolutely sue for damages in civil court. It, you can't, you just can't sue for an injunction in small claims, right? So small claims is financial only, not not conduct based and so regular civil court we're looking at conduct or money both any all any further questions i do see rick's hand up there yeah i just wanted to wrap it up because I just uh to be conscious of everybody's time and especially yours uh just want to thank you so much uh for your entire uh program here but I, I, if you just want, I'm not sure if you needed to finish up, but just wanted to go ahead and just finish this up. No, yeah, I, I think I, I think I got all the information I wanted to to get out to everybody. Uh, I did put my email in the chat if there, if you've got a burning question that I, we didn't get a chance to talk about, please feel free to shoot that over my way. Um, I will give you a small caveat that I am 
over capacity and very busy at the moment. And so if I don't respond to you for a while, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's simply because I am attempting to dig myself out of a hole. So <laughs> but I will and, get and, to you if, if you have a question. I will get back to you, I promise. And and we'll make this recording available as soon as uh, we can get a process and that'll be on our website. Um, with that, thank you everyone so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Samantha, for your great work. And um, feel free, uh, anyone that's still remaining, uh, feel free to email us if you had any, any questions on the recording. Uh, with that, Hope everyone has a great day and 